I'm glad we can la-la for Jesus, aren't you? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and give you the scripture text, because uh, it's going to take some of you a while to get there. The book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Now, I did not say Hezekiah. I said Ezekiel. Okay? Uh, that's about, uh, uh, well, just go to the Old Testament and turn right and keep going until you get there. Ezekiel chapter number 22 this morning, and uh, I just want to say to you that as Missy and I are at the Southern Baptist Convention this week, God just really rocked my world. And as a pastor, God just really, and as a Christian, God just really spoke to me and um, basically said to me, you go home and you just do it. You preach it loud. You preach it hard because the Bible says that God has chosen that the foolishness of preaching to save those that are lost. And I'm really convicted about our missions involvement. I'll tell you that right now, and you'll be hearing more about that later as we prepare for the next year. But today, I just want to give a warning before I start. Today is not going to be popular, but it's going to be truthful. I'm preaching directly to the men today. Now, ladies, that doesn't mean you're taking a break. There might be times where you stand up and shout, Amen. Amen. Have you found Ezekiel 22? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stalling so you can find it. I'm going to begin reading, I, I believe, in verse number 23. If you will, stand in honor of the reading of God's precious word. The Bible records these words. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, and may I just say to you, when God speaks to you, it's more real than anything you can see. Anything that you're going through, when God speaks from his word, it's truth. Ezekiel caught that. He says, Son of man, say to her, talking about Israel, you are a land that is not cleansed or reigned on in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured the people. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Look at verse 26. Her priests or preachers have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. You see, my job as a man of God today is to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong, what's holy and what's unholy, what's clean and unclean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. Does that sound familiar? Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus the Lord God says, When the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they have wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So look what God says in verse number 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make up a wall and stand in the hedge or the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it. The saddest words I think in the Bible, but I found none. I wonder if there's a man here this morning that God could trust. Therefore, I poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. I want to talk to you this morning for a few minutes on God's expectations for every man, what God truly expects. And I pray that you'll hear the word of the Lord this morning, and you'll, you and I will respond as God speaks to our individual hearts. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the privilege that I have to be back at Prospect Baptist Church this morning to share the Word of God. 
Lord, I pray for your holy anointing this morning. Lord, I realize unless I choose to decrease that you will not anoint me. Jesus, may you increase. May people see and hear you and not me. And may the Word of God come alive in our hearts today. God, I pray you'll speak to every man that's in this building today. On this Father's Day, may we be the men that we're supposed to be in Jesus' name. Amen, and you may be seated. Today I want to preach a message that's burning deep within the recesses of my heart. I feel like the prophet Jeremiah that says, there's a fire in my bones, and unless I speak it, I'm going to be consumed by this fire. This text records a time in history when the nation of Israel was in a decline, and it's very familiar to the day that we live in in America. It's almost like picking up the morning paper and reading the headlines of what's going on in our country that was going on in the nation of Israel in the day of Ezekiel. It's a time when the nation was in terrible trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, may I say to you today that our country is in terrible trouble unless the men of God, and, the, and I'm not talking about preachers, I'm talking about men in general, be what we're supposed to be for God. You see, it was a time that the prophets at that time were plotting conspiracies against the people, taking their money. May I say to you today, I'm not after your money. I'm after your heart. Because I believe that when we do what we're supposed to do, God provides everything we need to take the gospel literally to the nations. There are many a prophet today that's after people's money. It was a time where the priests of that day were violating God's laws and defiling the holy things of God. The priest had no convictions about what was holy. And they were not teaching the people the difference between right and wrong. Everybody basically did what was right in their own eyes. Can I say to you today, that's the picture of where we are as a church today. Nothing seems to be wrong anymore. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes, regardless what the Bible says. So I have chosen today to be a prophet of God and to stand in this pulpit and fill it under the Holy Ghost anointing and tell you what we're supposed to be as men. That Ezekiel said in this passage. The preachers of that day were giving false visions, implying that they had heard from God when in reality the Lord had not spoken a word to them at all. That's pretty serious. The common people were oppressing the poor and robbing the needy. The nation was in a major spiritual decline. Why is it when we have more spiritual helps today than we've ever had that were less moral than we've ever been? And, the, and the differ, there's no difference in this group than there is those that call themselves Christian, that don't call themselves Christian. It's just the truth. America today is dying spiritually because our pulpits all across the country are filled with men that refuse to preach the Word of God because they're scared of their congregation. Missy and I sat at the Southern Baptist Convention I'm not calling any names because I'm not supposed to do that. But I heard one man get up and tell our, he didn't preach the Bible. He tried to tell our convention some business principles that ought to be put in the church so that we can be better. I wanted to stand and say, time out! No! No! You can't do spiritual work with secular principles. God didn't organize it that way. I want to leave a legacy behind me. And maybe it'll be on my tombstone, I don't know, but I want people to say about me, when you heard him preach, he preached the Word of God. For what it said, Ezekiel said that God was seeking out a man and couldn't find one. You see, God is looking for a few men 
some men today that will step up to the plate and lead their family so that it will overflow in the church. The church will never be any stronger than our family units are. As I heard one person say it in Sunday school this morning, it was so good. If we can't do it at home, how in God's name are we going to do it here? I'm convicted. I've been convicted all week. I heard David Platt stand and preach. David Platt's a new preacher on the scene in Southern Baptist life, 30 years old. And David Platt stood and said that as New Testament Christians, that we are to do whatever it takes to reach the nations with the gospel. I heard Brother Johnny say, we're not going to rob Peter to, to pay Paul to reach the nations. He said, but if you ever get a burden for the nations, you'll rob Peter and Paul and do whatever it takes to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Our vision is so introspect. But God's looking for a man that'll take a chance, that'll take a risk, so that his name can be honored and people can hear the gospel. The word salt is a very interesting word in this passage. He said, I salt for a man. The word salt here means that God literally has the spotlight shining on every man this morning and is trying to find out who is willing to live up to the expectation so that he can use that man for the glory of God. It doesn't really mean he's looking for a preacher. He may just be looking for a godly father that will lead his children in the way of righteousness so that the church can be full of Holy Ghost power. Let me show you several things that the Lord's spoken to me this week, what God expects. And I can't live up to this apart from the Holy Spirit. But first of all, men, God expects men to be spiritual leaders. You don't hear much about this today. He goes on to say, I sought for a man among them. When you use the word spiritual in our context of today, it, it, it has absolutely nothing to do with what the world thinks spiritual is. The definition of Christianity has gotten so broad, hasn't it? Hey, Jesus just flat said it. He said, narrow is the gate and straight is the way that leads to eternal life and few be that find it, but broad is the way and many be there go that leads to destruction. The word spiritual simply means this. It means a man that is willing to allow the Holy Spirit to control his life and make decisions for him so that God can use that man to make a difference in his home. Can I tell you, I can pastor the largest church, whatever, but if my kids die and go to hell, I'm a total failure. Total failure. I've got six little eyes. Sets of eyes. That are looking at me and what they see in me will be their opinion of who God is. That's the bottom line. And so God is calling us to be spiritual leaders. There's several things about a spiritual leader, the kind of man that God was looking for. Men, you're responsible to lead your family spiritually. Ladies, listen carefully. You are not the spiritual leader according to the Bible. The man is. And the reason there's been, and please don't take this wrong. Just let me tell the truth. The reason there's been such an influx of women in spiritual positions in some churches where they should not be is because the men have become too sorry to step up and do it. Ladies, that'd be a good place to say Amen. Now, what you think a spiritual leader is is probably not what I'm going to say today. Because God was looking for one. A spiritual leader is not a man that appears, it to, appears to have it all together. It's not a man that's successful in the world's eyes. You see, a spiritual leader, first of all, is a, 
is a man that's broken. Now you listen to me this morning, man, please. Give me your heart for just a few seconds. It's a man that's broken. You say, what do you mean by that? You see, the problem with the nation in this text is that the men and the leaders were doing life their way instead of God's way. Sin filled the nation and nobody was broken over the condition that it brought. The prophets were not broken. The preachers were not broken. The people were not broken. Here's what brokenness is. And I'm asking God to keep me weak enough to keep me dependent. If you know what I mean. Brokenness is when we bring all of our weaknesses to God and admit to Him we have failed, but we won't change. That's what brokenness is. Men, when's the last time that you told God, Lord, I'm a total failure apart from you? Total failure. Matter of fact, there's nothing good about me but the Christ that lives in me. That's the only difference between me and a lost person. It's the Christ that lives in me. So many men are too proud to admit they need help. It's amazing. Families will begin to have trouble. And the wives will call. Son, it's quiet, isn't it? The wives will call and pour their heart out to the pastor. And the first thing I say is, well, could we get together with your husband and begin to work through this? Oh, he won't come. You know why? He's not broken. He's proud. A spiritual leader's got to be broken. That means you've got to realize your weaknesses more than ever this week. As I sat under holy men of God that preached the word, I realized I can't do this. I can't do it on my own. Unless I stay on my knees and stay broken before God, I can't even hear from God. Much less preach for God. Guys, my question to you is, are you broken? No, Brother Stoney, I'm fixed. Great Father's Day message. It's good. You got to learn to amen yourself when you preach this stuff. <laughs> amen, Bill. That's good. You keep going. Thank you. I will. David was a man after God's own heart. Do you remember David? Do you remember David and all his weaknesses and all his failures? I'm talking about a man that committed adultery, a man that committed murder. Yet the Word of God says, He's a man after my heart. Because he repented, he was broken. Then you have Saul. Remember Saul? The Spirit of the Lord once dwelt upon Saul. They anointed him as king. But Saul refused to get broken and ended up taking his own life. Guys, please, what would happen in our church if all the men would get honest and broken before God about the spiritual condition of our homes and our county? What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. We'd have a Holy Ghost, heaven-sent revival. And listen, our wives and our kids don't have a chance when we get broken. They follow. 1 Corinthians says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God deliberately chose the things of the world considered foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise, and He chose those who are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose those things despised by the world, things counted as nothing, and used them to bring glory to His name. God can only use a person that's broken because everybody else tries to steal the glory. God's not going to allow that. Secondly, it's not only a man that's broken, but a spiritual leader is, is burdened. I'm burdened about this. I'm burdened that I need to spend more of, my, more of our time discipling our men. And spending time with the men and, and teaching the Bible to them and, and helping them because so goes the men, so goes the church. It's just that simple. You see, they did not have a man in those days that had a burden that really cared. We need men today that are burdened about who we are. You say, what's a burden? A burden is a, 
a God-given sense of urgency that God can use you to change the circumstances. God needs a man to do that. Most men don't, they don't have a, they don't care where we are in Christianity. Guys, be careful how you lead your family. Because whatever we do in moderation, you listen to me, whatever we do in moderation, the generation that comes behind us will do in excess. In other words, if I lead my family to attend church twice a month, when my kids grow up, they'll lead their family to attend church once a month. What are we telling our kids? When the things of the world are more important than the things of God. I'll tell you exactly what we're telling them. We're telling them that God's not important and that what we want to do is more important than what God wants to do. And then when they get older, they can just live how they want to and it doesn't matter. I told you it wasn't popular. But it's flat biblical. I've got a burden. Let me tell you my burden. My burden is this. If we could mobilize this church where people would buy into the vision, where men would lead their families and, and children to buy into the vision where we... Guys, listen, we can take this county for Jesus. It's ripe for the picking. The people are ready. They're just waiting for a man of God to come and to be a leader. I'm burdened. Are you burdened? This is what a father's supposed to be. He's supposed to be broken. He's supposed to be burdened. Here's a staggering thought. If something doesn't change in our society and in our church life, what's our children going to be facing? What's my grandchildren going to be facing? How much, how much are we going to allow it to slip It's on my shoulders. And it's on your shoulders. And listen, your kids are not supposed to understand all the time. Be a man. Don't be a wimp with your kids. Amen. Well, Daddy, I don't want to... Here, here, let me tell you Josiah's favorite saying. And remember, he's not saved. Daddy, I love Jesus, but I hate church. <laughs> hey, that's one of mine. And there's times he don't want to come. And guys, listen. It's your responsibility to get your wife and kids to church. It's not mama's responsibility. Josiah, you can hate Jesus and hate church, but you're going in Miss Darla's Sunday school class because I know she's going to teach you something that you might hear. And listen, if he's around the Word of God, that's the only way he can be saved. Bring him to Bible school. Bring them, please bring them. Dads, get a burden for your kids and your families. America's going to hell. While we're so comfortable. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Burdened. The third thing a spiritual leader believes. He believes. In those days that of Ezekiel, nobody was believing God for anything. We need some men of faith that will believe God for the future. If you're not currently believing God for anything, then you're not walking by faith. I sat there and heard reports and said, Oh God, we can do that. Oh God, we can take the gospel to the nations. God from Albemarle, North Carolina, we can do it. If you'll put your power on it, you'll put your provisions on it, and our men will believe. Write it down. I'm willing to give everything I own for the gospel's sake. David Platt, boy, just you, when he gets up to speak, at first you think he's nuts. And he stood and he said, I was so convicted. He said, My wife and I have sold our home. and moved in a less fortunate place so that we would have resources to reach the world for Christ. 
30 years old, willing to give up the American dream so that people can hear about Jesus. And I thought, dear God, I'm so sorry. I repent. I'm so sorry for being so selfish. Aren't you? We say we care, but our actions prove something different. Believe. Let me tell you what I believe. It's going to take a lifetime to live it out. But I believe if this church will stay faithful and the men will rise up and be spiritual leaders, I believe that God will do a work in this place that will blow all of our minds. I believe it will be unbelievable what God can do in Albemarle, North Carolina, if we'll just get together as men and believe God for a miracle. Guys, will you be a spiritual leader? The second thing God expects is that men be surrendered vessels. Oh, my. He said, I sought for a man that should make up the hedge. What we must have today are men that are surrendered to the gospel. The words, I use the word surrender because here's what it means. Surrender is when you give up your way of living and you allow God to take you captive. I mean that he, he just hems you up and he takes you captive and he pushes you wherever you're supposed to be for the glory of God. The problem we have in our country is people are living for themselves and not for God. But we can change it. We can be a surrendered vessel. The opposite of surrender is rebellion. So what it means is if I'm not surrendered as a vessel to God, I'm in rebellion to God. And the Word says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I don't want to be that. You see, the result of men not being surrendered in those days, he said they need to make up a hedge, is the the walls of the cities were the most important part of the cities because it kept the enemy out. They kept building up the wall, and when the leadership of the men began to fall, there was nobody to stand on the wall and keep the enemy back, and the enemy got a hole in the wall, and then they came into the city and took over. What God is saying, we need some men to get back on the wall and surrender your whole life to Christ and be a vessel that He can use. God needs a man. You say, preacher, what do you mean about a surrendered vessel? God needs a man that will, first of all, be surrendered in reputation. You see, the reason the prophets and the preachers in this text were not surrendered is this. They were more concerned about the reputation with the people instead of their standing with God. If you're going to be like Jesus, you've got to get past what others think about you. Because I'm learning. You will not be popular with the world if you're popular with God. Matter of fact, he told the disciples the world's going to hate you. You see, I used to be on the other side. I sat under a man that was a surrendered vessel. That son preached it hot, preached it long, preached it hard, and preached it straight. And I walked in that church, and I, kind of like some of you are doing right now, I went, I'm not going to listen to that. And then Missy and I was going to get married. We were living in sin. I went to ask him to marry us, and he said, not until you repent. I told my wife, I'm not listening to that smart aleck preacher. We'll find somebody else that has no standards to marry us. (laughs) But then, a man that was willing to not allow me to change his reputation with God. When I walked into church and he preached the gospel, 
And every Sunday, the Bible says that beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. And I stood there and I looked at Brother Stan's feet and they were so beautiful as I was just doomed and damned in sin and couldn't get out. Alcohol had me. I couldn't stay married and I saw those feet that preached with the anointing of God and I ran to Jesus. I said, here I am, Lord. Save me and I got born again. And now I'm trying to build a reputation with God that people can come to Christ. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. Guys, you've got to get with God. Well, the guy at work, what will he think about me if I be a fanatic for Jesus? He'll respect you. And he'll know where to come for help. I had a person two weeks ago that I'd had a few dealings with here in town and he called me one day and he said, Brother Stoney, I got somebody that needs help. And I knew if I brought him to prospect, somebody would help him. What's your reputation in the community? Well, so-and-so's got bad business dealings. I'm not going down to that church. So-and-so cheated me a few years ago. I'm not stepping foot in that church. What about surrendering your reputation and repent and call that person and say, Hey, I'm so sorry. I failed. I sinned. I want to repent and make it right with you. The place will fill up if the men will surrender their reputation. Philippians says this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. We need some men that will die to themselves and live for the glory of God. Secondly, not only in reputation, but surrender to righteousness. You see, in those days, oh, listen to this. In those days, righteous living was an abnormal way of living. Is it not abnormal today if you're righteous? I mean, today, sex outside of marriage doesn't seem to be wrong. It just doesn't seem to be wrong. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, sin is still sin. And God cannot put his stamp of approval on an unrighteous lifestyle. He can't do it. He'd have to rewrite the book if he did it. So we've got to be surrendered to that righteousness. He, today, when you talk about righteousness and holiness, it, it's almost like you're speaking a foreign language. Come on, Brother Stoney, lighten up on your children. We're in the 21st century. Just let them do what they want to. In Jesus' name, I refuse to give my kids to the devil. I refuse to do it. You say, well, when they grow up, they'll fall out of church. Not if they get with God, they won't. They'll be full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I want my family to know the difference between right and wrong. And by the way, Dad, some of you need to tell some of your daughters to put some clothes on before they come to the house of God. Amen. Amen. Many a time I've had to turn my two oldest back and say, sweet, that ain't going to work. Oh, come on, Dad. Everybody else in the church is doing it. Well, honey, you're not doing it. Get yourself upstairs and put some clothes on and cover up. Y'all okay? <laughs> hey, for the glory of God, I just want to please God. I don't want to please anybody but my King and my Savior and the one that called me to do this. If I'd have known what I was getting into and I said yes, I'd probably said no. <laughs> have mercy. Righteousness. Righteousness. You know what righteousness is? It's just right standing with God. It's simple. It's not hard. Just do what's right. 
The results of unrighteousness were that the walls had been torn down and biblical morals were kind of decreasing. I'm going to make this statement. You listen carefully. We're having a lot of natural disasters, would you not say? Hey, this oil spill, I don't know if they'll ever get it stopped. Can I tell you why it's happening? Can I read from the Bible for you why it's happening? The Bible says in Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Our country has turned her back on God from your house to the White House. And the result is God is hurling natural disasters to get our attention. So we'll come back and be righteous. You say, well, could one man change this? Well, one woman got prayer out of school. Absolutely one person can change it. But it seems nobody will stand up and say anything. But the preacher. I'm going to keep saying it. Till Jesus comes. You see, uh, a generation ago, an American child could expect to grow up with his or her father. Tonight, Sunday night, June 20th, listen to this. More than one-third of American children will go to sleep in homes where their fathers do not live. Before they reach the age of 18, more than half of our nation's children are likely to spend at least a significant portion of their childhood living apart from their father. Every kid needs a daddy. Every kid needs a righteous daddy to teach them. The ways of God. Let me hurry. Surrender to rest restoration. God is looking for a man that will help restore the walls of righteousness back where they need to be. This is only going to happen if three things happen in my life and yours. It's that I personally have to get with God. I personally have to get with God in a quiet place. Jesus had a particular place every day that he went and got with the Father. That's the reason Judas knew where to go get him. I've got to get with God personally. I've got to get with God privately. God will never use somebody publicly that he hasn't worked over privately. Then God can use us publicly. Hey, if every man would catch this message and make a commitment to God at this altar, and then go out in this world, we could restore Stanley County overnight. I believe that if a revival comes, the bars will shut down. Amen. I believe they'll empty out. Because those people that go and visit those will get saved. And when you get saved, you get God's desires, and you don't quit drinking, you just change fountains. Amen. Restoration. Guys, are we going to do it, or are we going to let it go? The last thing, and I'm going to hurry. God expects men to be steadfast in their standing. Look what he says here, and I'll, I promise you I'll hurry. He said, I'm, I sought for a man that would make up a hedge and stand in the gap before the land that I should not destroy. What we need in America and in Stanley County is some men that will take a steadfast stand. Let me tell you what this means. Steadfast means that you're about it all the time. You don't allow anything to, to, to get you distracted. You keep going for Jesus. Regard, I, I said this morning to the Lord, God, it makes no difference what the crowd looks like this morning. I'm not preaching for numbers. I'm preaching for individuals that'll catch it. But we've got to be steadfast in our stand. You see, what this dying world could use is a willing man of God who dares to go against the grain. You'll never do anything for God and blend in with the world. Who dares to go against the grain and work without applause. A man who raises a shield of faith, protecting what is pure. A man whose love is tough and gentle. A man whose word is sure. Listen to this. God does not need an orator who knows just what to say. He does not need authorities to reason him away. He doesn't need an army to guarantee a win. He just needs a few good men. Just a few. Men who face eternity, who aren't afraid to die, who fight for freedom and honor once again. He just needs a few good men. Let me tell you the kind of people God uses. Boy, I've learned this. God only uses busy people. 
People say, well, I'm too busy for God to use me. That's the only kind of person God will use because they have the self-motivation and the drive to do it. He'll take a life that's broken, a derelict, a life that's broken, and he'll mold it back together in private as you spend time with him. Then he'll take you publicly and put you out there and let you stand. I want to take a stand. I'm going to take a stand on the Word of God if the whole church leaves. And I know you won't. Matter of fact, one guy said to me, you calm down and the place will empty out. Well, after being at the convention, I'm going to have to get fired up. You say, why do you get that way? Stop sending me. It's just what happens when I get fed the Bible. It just gets in me, and I, I just got to get it out, and I got to tell it, and, and preach it, and stand on it, and, and scream it, and yell it, and be radical for Jesus, because He's the only one, folks. Nothing else will work. Let me show you several things. I told you I'd hurry. I'm trying. I can't find the brakes. We need some men. I hadn't preached in a week. We need some men that'll stand in the gap. You see, there's a gap between what's right and what's wrong. God says, I just need a... I just need a vessel to work through. Just somebody that will stand in the gap and pull the two back together. I heard Bill Stafford this week. I went to a meeting this week to hear Bill Stafford take the offering. There's two preachers before him, and he said more in ten minutes, and they said all put together. He's standing in the gap. He said, Brother Stoney, I'm 76. And I'm still going strong. I can't quit. By the way, he's coming back next September. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Guys, will you stand in the gap? Will you be an intercessor? Will you stand in the gap and take unrighteousness and pull it to righteousness? I want to stand for God. Chronicles is very clear. You say, how do you, how do you stand in the gap? On your knees. Chronicles says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll heal from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. You know what God said? If I can find a group of men that will humble themselves enough to get on their knees and repent and ask for forgiveness, God says, I'll pour it down and I'll heal it. Listen, we can, he can heal our land and not heal our country. My land, I want him to heal where I'm walking, where you're walking. Will you stand in the gap? Secondly, will you stand with God? Some of the devil's crowd's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Do y'all watch television? Most of us do. Have you noticed how subtle the message is? Have you noticed how subtle that the devil will use sex to sell a product? Who's going to stand up against that? Who's going to stand for God? Hey, if you don't stand for God, you'll fall for anything. Hey, just be a man. Stop being a wimp. I saw some of you go, <laughs> back to you. Hey, folks. Last thing. Stand for the gospel. He says, I'm looking for a man that will make up the hedge, stand in the gap, that I can heal the land. Do you know the only answer is the gospel? The only answer is the gospel. Tell your kids about Jesus. Tell your neighbors about Jesus. Bring them to church so the preacher can tell them about Jesus. But on this Father's Day, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. June the 20th, 2010. I am beseeching and challenging the men of this church to get to the altar and make a commitment to God. I'm just asking you to get with God at the altar. You might be here and you need to be saved today. You can come anytime, men, anytime. I just... If you need to be saved or join the church, I'm right here in the center. But I'm asking the men of our church to get on the altar and tell God, Lord, I want to be a spiritual leader. God, 
I want to be a surrendered vessel. God, I, I, I want to stand. I want to steadfastly stand for you and for the gospel. And I want us to turn this country around, to turn Albemarle around. And dear God, help us. Dear God, help us. Men from all across the building, find your place in the altar on this Father's Day and make a commitment to God. I'll go for Jesus. I'll go for Jesus. Don't look and see who's coming. It doesn't matter. It's just you and God. I'll go. I'll have my family in church consistently. I'll teach my kids. I'll bring them to vacation Bible school. Hallelujah to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm going to give you a few minutes and I'm going to pray a prayer over you guys. I love you. You're my friends. You're my support. Guys, we can do it for Jesus. Let me have a prayer over you guys. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for every man that's at this altar. I thank you for every family that's represented. God, there's wives represented. There's children represented. There's grandchildren represented. And God, I pray that you'll just help these guys and help me to be a spiritual leader. God, I've failed and I repent. I'm sorry. God, I pray that they'll be broken before you. That they'll get burdened before you. They'll believe you for a miracle in their home. God, help them to be surrendered vessels, to surrender their reputation, to put it all on the altar today. Surrender to righteousness, God, and help us to, to make up righteousness again. That we can restore this county for Christ. God, may they stand in the gap. Lord, when it gets hard, it's a tendency to, to back off. Help us to stand steadfastly. Help us to stand for you, Jesus. And Lord, help us to stand for the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only answer to everybody's problems. God, I pray you'll raise up an army of men in this place that we can just charge the gates of hell with the greatest news anybody could ever hear. We love you, Jesus. We make a commitment to you right now. Men, you can spend as much time as you need or you can go back to see whatever the Lord would lead you. Let me say to the heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed. If you're here today and you need Jesus, you need to be saved, all you have to do is come forward and we'll take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. You might need to join the church this morning. Dad, Maybe God's spoken to you about your family being a member at Prospect. You're the spiritual leader. It's on you. It's not on your wife. You get with God and just listen to Him. Father, in Jesus' name, I've done exactly what you've asked me to do this morning. Lord, may you take this invitation now. Draw people to yourself. God, may spiritual decisions be made for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Let's stand. You come. Come quickly if you're coming. Come quickly. All to Jesus you surrender. All to Jesus. Who, can, who needs to come? You come. You need to be saved. You come. You need to join the church. You come. You come. Make a decision for Jesus. Make it for Him. Anybody need to make a decision? You come. One more verse. Nobody comes, so be it. This is it. This is it. Come quickly. Come to Jesus quickly.
be seated for just a second. I have just several announcements. Uh, if you're working in Vacation Bible School, by the way, there's no service here tonight. Uh, they'll transform this stage for the Vacation Bible School. There's a meeting following this service in the old sanctuary, and Rob promised it'll only be short. It will not be long, and uh, if you didn't sign up to work in Vacation Bible School and you want to, uh, just go to the meeting and you, you can find a place of service. Really be praying about this week uh, that we can reach uh, some families for Christ and, and get contacts and uh, as they'll share the gospel story with those kids. Uh, also, uh, Missy and I will be heading to Hickory now uh, to pick up our children. Uh, we dropped them off last Saturday and we're picking them up tonight. Missy will be coming back. I've got a meeting with the architect in the morning and then I'm going to the Piney Grove Baptist Church to preach tomorrow night. So uh, I'll be back in the office on Tuesday. But if we can help you, please, uh, please, please let us know. The, no Wednesday night service either because all, this, all the kids will be in here and uh, it's going to be just a wonderful, wonderful time. Guys, I love you. I thank God for you. And uh, God bless you for, for your service and let's just do it for the Lord. Amen? Okay. Any other announcements that I forgot? Yeah, Chad. Chad wants to meet with the people interested in Moldova over in the prayer room. Be fine. Uh, right after the service over here in the prayer room. Okay? Well, guys, happy Father's Day. Have a blessed time with your family, and we'll see you next Sunday on the 27th. Let's stand and be dismissed. I love you guys in Jesus. Guest, I'd love to meet you uh, out in the foyer. And uh, uh, CD, if you will, CD Biggers, if you will, close us in prayer. Uh, this is Donna Webster, and uh, Donna has been saved and baptized by immersion, and uh, she wants to join Prospect Baptist Church this morning by statement. All in favor, say amen. 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 Welcome, Donna, to the Prospect family. God bless you. Come by and, uh, and, and welcome Donna, and give me just a second, and I'll be out at the door. God bless. See you later.